Hello and welcome to this session of Development Dialogues. Uh, this one is called Putting People at the Centre of Rule of Law and Peacebuilding. I'm Fanula Sweeney. Now, during the next 90 minutes, we'll be hearing the reflections of those at the heart of the UNDP's work to support institutions to build peace and strengthen access to justice and the rule of law in both crisis and insecure settings. We'll be hearing reflections uh, with country examples from Somalia, Eastern Ukraine, and the Chittagong Hills tracks in Bangladesh, and how that all weaves through the bigger global picture of the UNDP's work. There will be an opportunity to ask questions towards the end of this session, and if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. In a moment, we'll be hearing from Jocelyn Mason, who is the UNDP's resident representative in Somalia. But first, before we hear from him, this video about the vital work being undertaken there. Somalia is one of the world's most unstable states. But despite more than three decades of conflict, a displacement crisis that has seen 2.6 million people forced from their homes, and natural disasters ranging from floods and droughts to locusts. The Somali people have stood firm throughout. Since 1977, UNDP has stood with them, supporting Somalis to deal with these challenges. Following the establishment of the federal government in Somalia in 2012, UNDP has been supporting government at the national, federal, and local levels. This includes assisting with decentralization efforts and the building of capacity of city and state authorities. Effective local governance builds trust in institutions. In Somalia, UNDP supports district governments to prioritize, plan, and deliver services to the populations they serve. For example, UNDP has supported a district government to establish a local marketplace, which helps 50 women support 50 families, boosts local tax revenue, and stimulates the local economy. In the aftermath of conflict, it's also crucially important to re-establish public safety and ensure the justice system is working effectively to protect all people, especially women. UNDP has placed this approach at the core of our work in Somalia, training police, judges and prosecutors. We supported women in the justice system through training of female lawyers to bring legal support to women and men across the country. After more than 40 years, UNDP remains committed to supporting Somalia in the long run. By supplying development expertise across a range of interventions, UNDP will work with the Somali people to strengthen their governance systems and to ensure no one is left behind. To ensure no one is left behind, only part of the work that has been undertaken by UNDP in Somalia. As I mentioned, Jocelyn Mason is here. He, of course, is the resident representative for UNDP in Somalia. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you, Fionula, and thank you all for uh, taking part in this uh, conference and uh, for attending um, of course, I'm speaking to you today from Somalia, a country that um, uh, which is trying to rebuild um, state structures uh, in the aftermath of war. And our state building efforts are taking place in the face of indeed a continuing conflict. The war between Al-Shabaab, uh, which is, as you know, an Islamic militant group, 
and the Somali government, supported by the African Union in Somalia, as well as Western forces, uh, costs thousands of lives every year. Or, as a Somali peace activist, Elwad Elman, recently put it, there is no post-traumatic stress in Somalia, only cyclical traumatic stress events that one has to survive. This reality makes our work incredibly challenging, but even more relevant and important. We are operating against the backdrop of ever tense security situation, which limits our access to the people we serve, compounded by uh, recurring natural disasters, and of course, over the last year and a half, COVID-19 as well, which has uh, significantly limited our ability to go out and um, um, deliver in the country. And whilst we help build state institutions and maneuver contested early stages of federalism, we have to ensure that the Somali people are heard and that the institutions we build serve their needs and priorities. When asked, most Somalis will mention security and justice as a crucial demand. In fact, it's usually the first thing they ask for among two or three things once uh, an area has been freed, for example, from al-Shabaab. But justice in Somalia often favors those who are influential enough to bend it in their favor. Somalia is a clan-based patriarchal society. If a minority clan member asks for justice in a case involving a member of a majority clan, whoever dispenses justice will likely favor the latter. Or for example, if a woman demands justice for a crime committed by a man, it will be an uphill battle for her against patriarchal structures. The formal justice system is still weak, accessible to few and easily swayed by those in power. Informal justice mechanisms tend to replicate local power dynamics with male clan elders dominating the discussion. Ironically, the violent extremist group Al-Shabaab offers its own Islamic justice mechanisms as a viable alternative, dispensing justice, draconian though it is, cheaply, swiftly, and sometimes less influenced by clan hierarchies. At the same time, the thought of ever getting justice for crimes committed by al-Shabaab seems almost impossible, even by those for whom al-Shabaab is the only provider of justice. But how will peace ever be possibly be uh, achieved as long as we have no means of holding those accountable who violate it? Finally, in Somalia, there are at least three different normative frameworks for justice, the traditional framework, the Sharia framework, and the formal framework. So when we speak about enhancing the rule of law in Somalia, we need to take these realities into account. Starting with the humble realization that preconceived notions of a justice system informed by Western models don't fit the multi-normative Somali realities. UNDP has developed initiatives that try to ensure our institution building efforts are tailored towards communities' needs and priorities. We recognize that rule of law reforms cannot be achieved solely through top-down institution and capacity building initiatives, but require essentially a socially transformative approach with strong citizen participation. Community conversations have therefore become the foundation of our work. Community conversations have been used in many countries in the health sector, but also in other areas such as good governance and gender equality. They have proven pow a powerful tool to empower communities and collective thinking processes and find creative and locally owned solutions. In Somalia, we are piloting community conversations as the foundation for addressing justice and security needs. Am I running out of time, Funula? You're okay for a moment, I think. Okay. We engage Somali communities in undertaking a deep reflection on justice and security issues, unpack the root causes of challenges, and seek community-based solutions. We further support communities in building the right partnerships with local governance, government authorities to implement and assess solutions. And I'm going to give you a couple of, of examples. Um, the deterioration of socioeconomic situation resulting from COVID-19 measures, for example, has resulted in an increase in burglary and theft throughout the country. Uh, in, the, in the city of Garraway, in the, in the state of Puntland, the problem of young people stealing mobile phones at night was brought up during community conversations. And the community decided to invite the leaders of youth gangs to one of their sessions. And while it was difficult to begin with to convince them to join, 
they ultimately decided to participate. And after the session, they joined youth volunteers in charge of neighborhood safety and hygiene as well. And in addition with their, uh, with their engagement, these, uh, they, were, they introduced new initiatives like community-based sports and um, organized and, and were able to organize youth um, around communal activities. And indeed the crime then uh, reduced significantly. Um, another example, and looking at the COVID uh, situation in particular, a UNDP joined up with the Office of the Prime Minister and the Ministry of Endowments and Religious Affairs for a three-day campaign in Mogadishu involving uh, Sheikh Ali Deer and other senior religious figures. And the important thing about this is that we reached out towards community leaders who normally would not be part of our engagement. Um, and uh, this, this led to campaigns that saw cars with loudspeakers and this sort of thing. But it also meant that these messages were imbued with the authority that traditional leaders were able to bring. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> Let me stop there. And I look forward to your questions uh, going forward. Thank you. Well, there, there, there's so much there. Thank you very much. I mean, you talk about accountability, you know, the need to bring in a society transformative approach. Uh, it would be interesting to talk to you later, perhaps, about the impact of COVID, as indeed everyone who will be hearing from. But thank you very much, Jocelyn, for the moment. So now to eastern Ukraine, where the conflict in the east has forced one million people to flee their homes since it began. We'll be hearing from the UNDP's resident representative on the ground. You see her there, Manal Tuani, in just a moment. But first, let's have a look at this video about the kind of work the UNP has been doing there. When armed conflict broke out in eastern Ukraine in 2014, millions of people were thrown into turmoil. Many lost their homes, which were destroyed in the fighting. 1.5 million people fled the region. Those left behind near the conflict's contact line, often the elderly and most vulnerable, were left without basic services and utilities, police assistance, jobs, or a functioning local government. Since 2015, UNDP has been helping people in the east of Ukraine recover and rebuild. We work closely with local communities to foster economic security. In addition, we work with Ukraine's government to improve their functioning and facilities and to ensure that they can deliver social services, policing and justice systems to those hard hit local communities. In 2020, UNDP ensured that nearly 300,000 people received quality administrative and social services through the restoration and construction of 14 administrative service centers across eastern Ukraine. We utilized innovative solutions such as specially designed mobile centers that bring administrative services closer to the people most affected by the conflict, including six near the contact line. Four more will come into service in 2021. We also provide legal advice centers at checkpoints on the contact line. Просто я выехала, мне вот надо свидетельство о рождении ребенка, родила ребенка там на территории. Куда идти и что я не знаю просто. Конечно, удобно. Я приехала здесь и мне сразу на месте я знаю прямо, куда мне пойти обращаться. Мне не надо ходить там по инстанциям разным, где мне будут посылать одного кабинета в другой. Это очень удобно. Спасибо большое, что есть такой пункт. As part of UNDP's holistic community security approach, we support the State Emergency Service of Ukraine. This ensures that people living close to the contact line can still receive services such as healthcare. This not only provides a lifeline for the vulnerable individuals, but also strengthens the bond between the state and its citizens. Большое спасибо вам за помощь, за все и за внимание. Это по честному. Если бы не вы, вы откликнулись очень, очень мгновенно, то я бы уже давно там был. У меня два инфаркта. Вот здесь я перенес. Вот, а? Все остальное потом уже подлечился нормально. In 2020, as COVID-19 spread, UNDP quickly moved to help local authorities fight the pandemic. We supplied thousands of items of protective equipment as well as 160 oxygen concentrators, five ventilators, and 10 patient monitors. UNDP has made a long-term commitment to serve the people of Ukraine to support governance, service provision, and justice institutions. 
In doing so, we will provide the most up-to-date expertise to address crises and ensure no one is left behind. And I think it's when you hear people like Vissel talk about how they would have been dead without the help of the UNDP that you realise just how much uh, this work is, is, is really vital on the ground. Uh, UNDP's Deputy Resident Representative Manal Fouani is joining us and we look forward to hearing what you have to say, Manal. Thank you so much, Finola, and good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, thanks a lot for connecting to this session. As you saw from the video, there is a lot that has been done, but allow me uh, to take you a few years back to 2013, and uh, probably the closing days of 2013, when probably no one had predicted that in just a few short months, Ukraine would have descended into uh, an armed conflict that lingers to our day transforming it into more of an active protracted crisis uh, in Eastern uh, Europe region. In 2014, when the line of contact between government and non-government controlled territories had settled, the fragility of uh, regional and local public administrations in Eastern Ukraine and probably the state at large had been uh, starkly laid bare. Around 3 million Ukrainian citizens, as we saw, were cut off from the rest of the country in the non-government controlled areas, while uh, more than 1.5 million people had been displaced internally, of course, uprooted from their homes in the East and forced to rebuild their lives elsewhere in the country, but particularly focused in the region of Eastern Ukraine. The armed conflict in uh, Ukraine had cracked actually um, Ukraine along multiple, if we can say, intersecting fault lines of political allegiances, economic interests, and plummeting trust towards the authorities and the state institutions, particularly at the local level, if we can focus on this one. Therefore, in 2015, when UNDP in Ukraine launched its recovery and peace building program, we have actually faced a matrix of interconnected issues of fragility that had to be addressed in a comprehensive and an integrated manner in order to um, help re-establish the rule of law stability and sustainability of the services uh, of public administration, including reinforcing the social contract between citizens and the state. Since then, I can say that UNDP Ukraine has been playing a major role in upholding these efforts by uh, leading what is known to many UNDP colleagues as the Joint UN Recovery and Peace Building Program that is supported by 12 development partners and implemented by four UN agencies. This joint UN endeavor addresses people's priority and needs in Eastern Ukraine through um, a system-wide integrated approach tackling three interlinked thematic components. First, we work on promoting economic recovery and infrastructure rehabilitation, dealing with the physical damage and by the armed conflict and the loss of jobs and livelihoods. Secondly, the program concentrates on uh, pretty much supporting the local governance and the implementation of the decentralization reform, which fosters efforts to rebuild the capacity of local government, making it participatory, accountable, and trustworthy. So to re-establish the trust towards authorities, uh, that was a major priority for us, and it remains at the core of our people-centered interventions in the region. Thirdly, uh, the third component of our work in an integrated manner focused much more on rule of law, boosting rule of law, community security and social cohesion, and helping rebuild public trust in law enforcement and justice institutions, as well as strengthening relationships between communities, civil society and the state. And at later stages, we also brought in the private sector. So evidently in our example in Ukraine, uh, the success of the rule of law and access to justice related work pretty much relied on also the steady progress of the support to livelihoods and local governance capacity development program. And that is an interlinked approach that um, allowed us to, to improve our interventions on the ground. One other important element of our approach is to concentrate on this comprehensive capacity development and strengthening of institutions, both at the local level, but also uh, contributing to the national level policy dialogue as well. So we have been improving uh, the reach and quality of critical services provided by the government, expanding coverage to remote locations along the contact line and the conflict affected regions, and then uh, making sure that no one is left behind. What we saw in the video is the contact line uh, people or, or citizens of Ukraine who live there 
uh, or who live in non-government controlled area and cross to um, the government controlled area to get their services. So we actually improved the access to service and we um, innovatively brought the services to them through mobile, um, mobile uh, trucks that would avail public administration activities to them. So this people-centered approach is ensuring that the most vulnerable and the most affected by the conflict can eventually get an unhindered access to administrative and social services as well as free legal aid. And we saw those trucks in the video as well. So just in short, I would say that this comprehensive nexus of different interventions between livelihood support, economic development or economic recovery, but also looking into supporting the decentralization reform and uh, the, the local service provision has supported the peace building and reconciliation in the conflict affected area, had allowed people to ensure that they are resilience, uh, resilient to, to destabilization and to further shocks, including the, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has further actually compounded existing conflict uh, related challenges in, in Eastern Ukraine. Many examples of different rule of law support and community uh, security and social cohesion activities from community policing to women's support of, of police work at the community level um, to the, the famous, I always recall them in Ukraine, uh, community security and social cohesion working group that I'm happy to talk more about in, uh, in the coming um, uh, session for the question and answers. So this is just a snapshot of what we do in Eastern Ukraine. And again, over to you, Fionala, for uh, maybe uh, more details in the question and answer session. Thank you. Yes, and we look forward to questions uh, coming in towards the end of the session. And certainly you raise a number of points there, particularly community cohesion, uh, which we can hopefully dive into a little later on. Thank you. Manal Fana Poani, UNDP's resident, uh, deputy resident representative in uh, Ukraine. Uh, now to the Chittagong Hills tract in Bangladesh, where among other things, the UNDP has helped strengthen community cohesion, something we've just been hearing about from Manal. We're joined in a moment, uh, joined right now, as I can see, by Sudabito Mukherjee, who is resident representative of UNDP Bangladesh. And uh, we will be speaking to him in just a moment. But first, the video uh, that we're going to show you describes some of the work that's going on there. The Chittagong Hill tracks in the southeast of Bangladesh have a long history of crisis, ended by the signing of the peace accord in 1997. This remote and culturally diverse region of Bangladesh is now making progress. Since 2003, UNDP has worked closely with the three autonomous Hill district councils created through the peace accord. These councils had little experience in the management of resources and yet were responsible for providing all key services to the local population, including education and healthcare. We have helped train and equip council members and staff. UNDP invests in institutions at the central and local levels to promote inclusive governance and as a way to improve basic services, public safety and justice systems. UNDP's assistance has resulted in improved health services to 500,000 people through a network of 850 community health service workers, 80 satellite clinics, and 17 mobile medical teams. I was training for the first time I was training for the first time I was UNDP also helps rural children in the Chittagong Hill Tracks access high quality education. This includes supporting 20,000 students in 315 government run schools and printing textbooks in local languages. We also know that poverty can stall education, so we provide snacks and clean water in schools and distribute uniforms to students. <laughs> After conflict, re-establishing public safety, especially for women, is essential. UNDP has made this a central theme, including through the establishment of eight women-friendly police stations and 600 community policing forums. Building community safety also means strengthening social trust. This is why UNDP has trained 100 trust builders 
to support positive dialogue and foster harmony across communities. With many years of experience in the region, UNDP continues to be committed to long-term engagement in the Chittagong Hill Tracks to improve governance, provide the latest development expertise and leave no one behind. Some of the work taking place there in the Chittagong Hills Tract in Bangladesh. And Sudipto Mukherjee joins us now, of course, resident representative on the ground there. Look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Fionula, and good day, everybody, whichever part of the world you're joining in from. Unlike the two previous speakers, I'm going to use a PowerPoint presentation, so let me try and share my screen. So there you go. I hope people can see the screen right now. So this is UNDP Bangladesh's longest running project. It is almost uh, 20 years in running and has actually evolved over a period of time. We are right now in the third phase of the uh, program. And uh, we started almost immediately after the peace accord was signed. You saw that in the film. So just to give you a sense of the context, there was this protracted civil war, uh, you know, people wanting to actually, uh, you know, uh, wanting to separate from the, uh, the, the country uh, itself from 1977 to 1997, and the peace accord was signed in 1997. It is extremely ethnically diverse. There are uh, many, many tribes, some in majority and some very few people. Uh, it it's actually 1% of Bangladesh's population. It's extremely geographically and culturally unique compared to plainlands. You see this, this could almost be the Switzerland of Bangladesh. Uh, poverty has always remained widespread and the region has been uh, still lagging behind in many respects in terms of development outcomes. Uh, there was a move, there was a move in the, during the military regime in the 70s and 80s to actually impose some level of demographic change where people were resettled here. Uh, these are Bengalis from other parts of uh, landers, Bengalis from other parts of the country who were settled here. And that actually put a lot of pressure and com competition on resources. And the pressure on land seems to be increasing. This is a very strategic location bordered by India in most sides. Um, community level tensions remain. And, but fortunately, there has been no major outbreak of any major conflict. And then of course, there are issues of identity on issues of human rights, and then, of course, violence against women and girls continue. The Peace Accord, the Peace Accord of 1997, recognizes the CHT as a tribe inhabited region and reflects the need to preserve the characteristics. And we can go into it, what has been done about it. It actually, uh, for the moment, uh, provided a little bit of autonomy, partial autonomy, and it remains partial still. Uh, and interestingly enough, these were nominated uh, members of the different councils uh, till date no elections have been held uh, there has been a separate ministry at the national level which has been provided uh, with a with the responsibility of actually uh, managing the, the the region itself comprising three districts it recognizes traditional governance and basically there are uh, the three sort of circle offices uh, largely uh, meant for the larger tribes there and there has been some level of devolution which has occurred, but it still remains uh, partially implemented. And in, in fact, one of the major things which has happened is uh, there has been a partial drawdown of temporary army camps. The army still remains there. And the land issue has also been partially addressed in terms of setting up a land commission, but nothing really happening after that. And then, of course, there have been some level of land allocation for landless uh, tribal families. And more recently, through UNDP support, uh, cadastral survey. Now, this, the approach remains pretty much the same from what you heard from the other two presentations. Uh, this is an area-based development approach, which means that we concentrate and focus on multi-sectoral interventions in one geographical area and making sure that the peace dividends are actually you know, are received and sent to all remote corners. And it includes um, work on education, health, what you all saw in the firm. Uh, we've tried to connect people to actual services and to the market. Uh, there are proactive uh, conflict prevention measures that are taken. 
the CHT institutions, you heard about the regional uh, councils. Uh, there has been a, a long-term program of ca capacity building and capacity strengthening. And then of late, of late, and this is important, uh, we are beginning to see that even climate change, which is affecting the rest of Bangladesh, is beginning to affect the Chittagong Hill tracks as well. And this puts further you know, pressure in terms of resources. And basically, uh, we have actually established uh, something called village common forests, where the communities are actually managing the forests itself. And the slogan is that, that there will be water as long as the forest exists. And uh, in fact, even in some places, we are actually beginning to see water scarcity as well. Uh, very quickly, uh, these strategies also include policy advocacy, a strong uh, sort of you know, focus and continuous dialogue on the peace accord implementation, natural resource management, and making sure that indigenous people's rights are um, actually held, upheld. Just to also mention that you know, in, in the context of Bangladesh, Bangladesh does not even recognize the word indigenous. So even in official documents, we are not allowed to use the term indigenous. Um, we have actually, given the fact that, you know, again, like, you know, we heard it in Somalia, here also you have a situation where different tribal uh, laws exist, there are national laws, etc. So we try to do some work in terms of harmonization of uh, laws. Uh, we have actually uh, proactively, you know, uh, trained insider mediators or set up early warning systems. We've actually worked on women and girls empowerment. Uh, there's a massive program on youth development. And I mentioned this particularly because there's something unique about the Chittagong Hill Tracks that even if you take people out of Chittagong Hill Tracks and actually take them to, we've taken them on Australian scholarships, they all come back, back to the Hill Tracks and stay there. They're very rooted to the land. And therefore, if you want to actually get development you have to bring development to their doorstep. They will not leave for jobs elsewhere, which is otherwise, you see, you can find Bangladeshis in every corner of the earth or even on the moon, but not uh, people from the Chittagong Hill Tracks. And then, of course, I mentioned about climate change resilience building. This is something newly started. And of course, related to it is disaster risk reduction efforts, because one of the things, the practice which is which happens in, in the hill tracks is something called June cultivation, which is shifting cultivation. So uh, we are often affected by landslides, mudslides, and people still come, keep coming back to where they actually find land fertile enough to actually have the livelihoods. And then access to justice. Uh, we are working on two fronts. We have a, a system of uh, alternate dispute resolution, which is active in other parts of Bangladesh. We are extending it to uh, even to the hill tracks, but we are also simultaneously working on strengthening the tra traditional justice systems because there are the local tribes who prefer to access the traditional justice systems. And of course, you know, if you really, I'm going to read the headings to just to stick to time. So there has been a major focus on actually giving access to different kinds of livelihoods, uh, particularly through uh, agriculture, which seems to be the mainstay of livelihoods. In, uh, so you have about 100,000 marginalized farmers who've actually learned modern agricultural te technology. And I can tell you that the products from the Chittagong Hill Tracks are amazingly good. But again, there are issues of connectivity to markets. And now we're working on supply chains and connecting them to markets. Uh, we have been working on infrastructure and service delivery. Uh, you saw that you know, the UNDP had actually helped to set up schools. But we've been fortunate that 85% of the schools that we set up, we've been able to successfully transfer them back to the government who runs them now. Uh, we've actually given access to OSAID scholarships. Uh, again, uh, there, were, there are deployment of community health service workers and mobile medical teams, and you saw that in the film as well. Uh, on social cohesion and conflict prevention, one of the things that we've done, actually, we've identified, you know, basically these are women's groups. Uh, they're called village development committees. They've been organized and capacities have been built. Uh, there is... Uh, the amendment, uh, which actually was carried out, uh, which recognizes the existence of other people uh, who are there. Uh, we've now been able to actually, even at the national parliament level, we have been able to set up a parliamentary caucus on the, uh, the tribal people there. And then, of course, there is a draft act, uh, which is on Bangladesh indigenous people's rights. Uh, we, we Just like in Ukraine and Somalia, here too, we have women-friendly police stations established. And then, of course, there's this whole issue of mobility restrictions which used to exist. 
nearly 65% at the point of time of signing the accord that people could move from one place to the other, but that has been significantly reduced now. And then uh, we have actually uh, upheld the, the, the right to use the mother tongue uh, in national education. So we've been actually we're providing you know, textbooks and books in, in the local language as well. Uh, this is again showing you that we've been investing a lot in building confidence among young people through you know, training in karate and judo and other things, martial arts. Uh, we've focused on improved governance. Uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. There has been no relapse of any major armed conflict in the last 23 years. Uh, we have actually responded to communal violence whenever it happens. We are trying to actually uh, work on the land commission. I mentioned to you the land commission has been set up, but it's not really active still. So the work still remains in terms of, you know, trying to make sure that the land commission is active and is able to respond to land disputes. And of course, now with this new focus on uh, traditional justice system strengthening and also introducing the alternate dispute resolution mechanisms, which is uh, active in the existing Bangladesh. And uh, some challenges remain because uh, one of the problems is that, you know, the, it's, uh, the, the, the weakness of institutions, the local institutions remain and they, in a sense that in the absence of any elections, in the absence of any elections, they, there is no motivation to improve uh, the quality of service delivery. So that is something that remains as a problem. There is a fear of secession that exists amongst the ruling class in Bangladesh. Uh, there is resistance from some sections of the civil and military bureaucracy. In fact, uh, army remains there. Uh, we are unable to go there easily. Uh, as internationals, we have to take permission uh, well in advance. So we largely dependent on the nationally or locally uh, employed and locally recruited staff. But occasionally, we are able to go there. It takes about a month's permission. And then, of course, con from time to time, we've tried to make, we've tried to keep this. And this is an important bit, I think, We've tried to keep this into a multi-donor, a multi-party development partner program so that we can actually get many parties actually into any advocacy with the government. And so from time to time, we have uh, tried to you know, make sure that we don't lose international commitment to stay engaged on peace and human rights and governance uh, that was envisaged in the peace accord. And that is the end of my presentation. I hope I was able to stick to time. Well, you know, you, you certainly describe what seem to be, uh, you know, multiple challenges there, and we look forward to getting to those in a moment. So thank you very much, Sidipto there, and to each of our speakers that we've heard from who've given us the view on the ground from where they are. But uh, let's weave through that now with uh, some of uh, the bigger picture issues and some global reflections now from Katie Thompson, who's head Rule of Law, Justice, Security and Human Rights Team at UNDP. Katie. Thanks so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here, and it's wonderful to be presenting with the country office colleagues. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about uh, UNDP's perspectives on the rule of law, access to justice, people-centered security, and and, uh, and and governance of these sectors. I mean, obviously, as many of you will be aware, we do this work, a very dedicated work, um, through a, a global program which highlights and brings together many of the different approaches the controversial colleagues have focused on, a major contribution towards uh, countering facility, um, trying to work on re-establishment of um, the core functions of the rule of law systems in the aftermath of conflict, and really trying to engage in a manner that is not purely institution-centric, but thinking about people. We're working on the rule of law, not just for the protection of the state, but for the protection of the people and communities themselves, in particular women, in particular excluded groups, um, to try to ensure that the way we do business in this area um, is, is somehow contributing to the SDGs and contributing in a way that is uh, very specific to the dynamics of the setting in question. What we do in UNDP is this, this work on rule of law, security and human rights is very much in the context of our broader offer on governance, um, our history of engagement in democratic governance and complements very much the work we do on peace building, uh, localized approaches, which um, you've been hearing a lot about today. Um, and, and my colleagues uh, who've worked with me to organize this meeting really bring this additional dimension. So 
what I'm going to do is just to talk a little bit more about the rule of law and security and justice angle. And those colleagues will speak a bit about the broader um, sexual engagements that complements this. Um, you've been hearing about this broad diversity of political, economic, cultural environments that we work in and the different types and nature of conflicts and risks that our colleagues are facing. So we're working with populations who experience trauma, loss, upheaval, and what we do in UNDP is effectively, uh, we would stay engaged for the long term, whilst we will be able to calibrate our programming over time from uh, focus on prevention and addressing the root causes of the challenges, to also working with government who may be in the midst of crisis or, or trying to recover. We work both on area-based approaches, and we work also on macro countrywide approaches. Most critically, though, and this is something that you will see in our focus on the floor in the next uh, uh, three to four years as we recalibrate our program and we recalibrate that against the new UNDP strategic plan, is that we'll be we are taking a much more explicit, conscious, intentional, people-centered approach to our work. It will sit alongside traditional institution building that looks at measures around efficiency and measures around um, effective governance but it will be a consciously people-centered approach, a rights-based approach, that, and, they, and that will be our message, and that will be our message to our partners to ensure that the focus isn't really only about strengthening the state against um, the needs of the people. So we have in, in UNDP a proud history of working on access to justice, and in the last year that work has increased in the context of the pandemic. If you, uh, we will be launching our annual report next week at our, at our annual meeting. You're going to see great examples of that access to justice work in Central African Republic, Burundi, the Kyrgyz Republic, Liberia, and the strong focus on, work on SGBV, which has unfortunately been a, a palpable need in the last year and a half. In particular, also I want to talk about security. People-centered security is a relatively new concept. We are trying to work very hard with a set of partners who are engaged in security sector reform to recalibrate thinking around security work in the context of development. Our work in places like Burkina Faso in Lebanon, where we try to work very localized approaches which are explicitly linked to peace building, are our entry points for trying to ensure that policing services and security services are serving people's needs, um, even in the context of extreme violence. And this focus on people-centered security is linked also obviously to work with communities who are affected by uh, combatants who've been associated with militias or with um, those designated as terrorist groups to work with them very hard to look at essentially counter impunity, but also to ensure that um, communities are reintegrated well in a manner that addresses future risks. And that work, which is obviously very, very pertinent in Syria and Iraq and across the Sahel region is an important part of our work in conflict context. I'm looking for a signal just to check whether how many more minutes I have. Well, um, you, you have maybe one more minute. Katie. One more minute. Just a word on innovation, digitization, and contribution to financing for development. Three critical enablers for UNDP's future strategic plan. Very critical to the work we do on rule of law, security, and human rights. Um, the whole focus on digitalization has been um, a, a particularly important in the context of the pandemic to enable people to, um, to access justice, but we are also working on a rights-based approach to digitization to make sure um, that the capabilities of the state to work in this domain are work again at the services, at the service of people and communities and rather than against their interests. You'll be seeing in UNDP strategic plan a very strong focus on these three enablers of all of our work. Um, and I'm very happy to know that we're ahead of the curve as you've been hearing from the colleagues here. Um, so I'm going to pause there because I think that we've got plenty of time for Q&A. We can throw in more examples and talk a bit more about this work. Um, and I just want to thank you all very much for being here. Well, thank you very much, Katie. I mean, it's great to hear that you think that, you know, generally speaking, you're ahead of the curve and we'll dig into some of the issues later, particularly security. I'm interested in why it's a relatively new concept. We we have an opportunity, of course, for, for those who are attending this session to put your questions in the Q&A chat box. I promise we will get them towards the get to them 
towards the end of this session. But a question now for all our panelists, and Katie, I hope if you're if you're happy to that you can take part as well. And I want to throw this out to whoever would like to 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 pick it up, either any of you, Manal, uh, Sudip to Katie or Jocelyn. What do you think when you're addressing these challenges that you face in your respective countries and the bigger picture? What do you think, generally speaking, if you can pinpoint has worked and hasn't worked? And when you're addressing crises such as you're experiencing in each of the countries you're based in, um, how would you contextualize them? And what factors enabled or perhaps constrained the outcomes of the work that you're doing so far? And that is a question for anyone who'd like to take it, Manal. Happy to start, yes. Is there anyone else starting? No, you're welcome. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think this is a crucial question because it is important for us to look back and to see what had worked and what had not. And, and I think one of the major uh, uh, parameters to assess our success is to look on the, at the impact of, of what we're doing. Uh, delivering such administrative or other crucial social and legal services or working in the rule of law sphere um, is not an easy process. Of course, it's a lengthy one and it's important to ensure a participatory approach. I think, at least in the Ukrainian context, when we work around uh, uh, along the contact line, it's also quite sensitive politically and, and it's important to ensure the sovereignty of the country. So when, when doing so, we need to um, embark on an exercise that, that has that takes on board the opinions of everybody. And I think Katie has referred to the importance of innovation, of digitalization at times of COVID. I'm happy to say that this has already started even in Ukraine before COVID, just to allow for people to be participating in these processes. So what, what had worked is that, uh, at least in the Ukrainian context, is that we took into account the participatory approach. We took into account the time needed to respond. Uh, it is important to connect between uh, local level and national level and to create this dialogue between the two so that we do not also further contribute to the seclusion or the segregation of, uh, of, of the communication for public administration um, service delivery. Uh, one of the ideas that I would like to highlight here uh, is, uh, is actually some of the innovative solutions that we have introduced. In addition to the mobile administrative service center that you saw in the video, we've had um, a mobile app actually that, um, that facilitates citizens to know their rights and to have better access to free legal aid, to, to better services, to see what are the consultations that are needed for the conflict affected population, uh, establishing these uh, integrated social services. I think one of the major also successes that we had is the community security and social cohesion working group, which is a combination of people, uh, citizens, government officials or local authorities, representatives, civil society. And that is something quite important because through civil society, you can ensure that you have women, the most vulnerable youth and people with disability are actually present in these functions. So I would say plan with everybody, for everybody and ensure that no one is left behind is kind of the motto for, for our work. And thank you, Manal. And it really is that connection also between the local and the national level, respecting sovereignty. And so, Dipto, if I could come to you with the kind of same question about what's worked and what hasn't. You mentioned the rights of Indigenous yeah. people and how can they be included and, and how is that working or what is not working in, in terms of well, you know, trying to be inclusive there? I think, you know, let me, let me go back, you know, what happened, you know, as I told you that in 1997, the peace accord was signed. And in 1998, we had the first international conference that was actually organized by UNDP. And by 2002, we actually had a multi-sectoral assessment mission to really understand for ourselves a better appreciation of what was driving the conflict there and, and, and what needed to be done in order to be able to implement the peace accord because that was the, was the mandate that we started. We realized that it was important that it had to be a multi-sectoral approach. And I mentioned the the, the issues of you know uh, making it area-based approach. We had to address deprivation on multiple fronts, whether it was access to basic services, access to justice. Uh, we had to make sure that in whatever we were doing, we were doing it in a conflict-sensitive way. I, uh, the whole approach of do no harm. Uh, our presence on the ground was extremely important because I think you know one of the problems was the fact that given the fact that you still have uh, the armed, uh, the uniform uh, forces being present on the ground there, although there has been some reduction in terms of the 
drawdown of temporary camps from 500, we're down by to 300 right now. But our presence on the ground, this is not a project or program which is run from Dhaka, it's run from the three districts themselves, and we have many other offices there. They run on run from the ground, and I, I think that actually provides a lot of confidence to people that there is that international presence or that is a neutral presence to of, of you know people who are available to reach out and help them when, when required. And I think very importantly, I think you know there is work, working both with institutions and working with people. I think that is important because I think a lot of investments are actually on the people themselves in terms of building their awareness of what their rights are and who they can go to and and and, and making sure that you know uh, at the same time we are also uh, the conduit often between the the national ministry and and the and the local councils as well as the local communities themselves and of course i i mentioned that you know one of the things that we've we've managed to do quite well so far at, at least because and that's one of the reasons i told you that it continues to be a very long running program because you know in a in a world where there's a global competition for resources keeping the tension on keeping the tension on the chitango hill tracks making sure that its people and there are not forgotten after 23 years of the peace accord signed is something that we've been quite successful so far and i think you know there is a fourth phase being designed and we have uh, reason to believe that despite a covid affected world which is much more oda constrained we'll still be able to uh, get some resources to continue our work there well that's something we'll come to in a moment uh, covid of course and its impact on i suppose really liaising with people you know and traveling to meet people in local areas um jocelyn do you have any thoughts on on this as as you hear the other speakers Yes, thanks, Tina. I, I, I just um, maybe just a couple of remarks. I mean, first of all, I think that uh, what's at the core of what um, Manal and Sudipto have both been saying uh, is one is uh, first of all, one has to address this uh, the tremendous amount of humility. I mean, it's about listening to the people that we serve first and foremost, and not coming with uh, with preconceived notions, but having but really. Um, and that's where I think the the, the points that um, both uh, my colleagues have made about create are really about creating spaces for people to express themselves, either whether whether it's on electronic platforms or organized sessions or whether um, you know depending on the circumstances of the country and the level of sophistication of the country, or whether it's through um, sort of type of fora, through processes, for example, of governance. I mean one. Uh, one particularly successful, and the second point I think I also want to make is that one needs to be in it for the long haul. Um, these things don't happen over overnight. Um, and looking at examples of where we've had successes, creating, for example, participatory planning process at subnational level can start with very few engagements from uh, vulnerable groups or marginalized groups or women, but slowly the engagement um, uh, can can grow up, and those not only do those people then enable them uh, are enabled to have the space and time and expression uh, and ability to express themselves on their needs, but it also means that they themselves are able to become more um, fulfilled parts of the community itself. I mean, we must remember, I think, and this goes back to my point about humility, that we're transforming certain we're transforming societies, and that has to be done. It has to be an internal process. Uh, let me stop there. Um, and is there anything that you think might actually uh, prevent attention engagement for the long haul? Because it's something Sudipto raised as well. Well, I, mean, I think that we as, as um, external partners have a notoriously short attention span, for one thing. Um, I think that our, you know, we can get, uh, are certain types of cycles of reporting and uh, finding results uh, in a short space uh, all drive a, a level of short termism. I think um, we need to be able to find ways of um, satisfying those um, perfectly understandable needs on the part of our donors, for example, to this process, but at the same time engaging um, those who are supporting the country in a sort of more longer term enterprise. Um, it can be a challenge, but I think that's uh, core to, to success. 
Katie, uh, you've had a chance to catch your breath after your remarks just a few minutes ago. As you listen to the panelists here, I mean, what goes through your mind, particularly with the kind of bigger picture? What might UNDP do differently going forward? Um, thanks. Yeah, um, I think a couple of things I wanted to emphasize, which is you know, um, the longer term perspective. Um, one of the things that we realized after working for eight to nine years, very engaged in working with around 45 conflict affected countries, is that we started to see that we were doing the same thing again a few years later. So we started to see that what we were not necessarily doing is changing the real fabric of the, of the political economy to underwrite the rule of law to establish the lasting changes that we needed to do. So, um, and we want to be very honest about that. As Jocelyn has said, this is a, we are, we're in this work for the long haul in many of the contexts that we work in. Um, we work with a donor community and who are also working on cycles of engagement, as he's mentioned, and, and we need to sustain, um, and we are working with our national counterparts who are also on political cycles. So if change takes place over a generation and uh, politicians and bureaucrats are only engaged for a shorter period of time, it's up to us to think about what the changes we want to see in the longer period of time. And this is why the SDG framework has been really useful. It puts in place this longer term perspective. What we have tried to do is put in place active learning from a parallel independent part, um, organization that we commissioned to look at our work over a 10, 15, 20 year uh, perspective so that we can see whether our assumptions that we put in place at the beginning of our program remain correct after such a long period of time. This is called an outcome-based evaluation in the sort of bureaucratic language, but it's really looking at what someone in the q and is asking, is asking me, so how do you test your assumptions? How do you know if your theory of change is, is the right one? Um, so this is one of the mechanisms we're putting in place to support our country offices in that longer term uh, learning. The other way, Jocelyn has emphasized, it's really about listening. It's really about engaging at community level, tracking need by engaging uh, participatory approaches and making sure that we're not only working at capital level or with those sitting in state level institutions. I think in, in, in the Lebanon, we haven't talked too much about the Lebanon or Pakistan, but our decentralization focus and our work on the um, to enable local governments to respond to the security needs, the demands for services, um, and in, indeed also human rights accountability is, is really apparent in those two countries in the work we do on a decentralized basis. So obviously for Lebanon, it's working with the communities to adapt to the influx of Syrian refugees to make sure both the refugees and the host communities are able to access services and have their rights respected. In, in Pakistan, this is part of the a longer term, it's a constitutional architecture of Pakistan where we work um, with the provincial governments to really make sure they're able to adapt and they're able to bring to, bring to bear the services and, and the balance on human rights that's needed um, to enable them not to um, not to experience, let's say, localized violence, and also to address the challenges of gender-based violence. So I think this local approaches and the long-term approaches is something that we are particularly good at emphasizing. And I think we're fairly humble as an organization. We know that we have to learn, and hence we're doing that in the strategic plan. Um, so, uh, and that's an important component of, of who we are, other development programming. Thanks. Katie, no, thank you very much. Really appreciate um, the, the kind of context that you're giving and uh, your sense of the way forward. Um, we, uh, I've been saying this throughout, but obviously we're, we're getting a lot of questions from you. We'll be going to those questions uh, in just a moment. But in our concluding remarks for this session, I'd like to go to Amy Gill, who's government leader, core functions and local governors, conflict prevention, peaceability and responsive institutes team UNDP. Amy, thank you. Thanks, Vanula. We like to have long titles to make sure that everything is involved. Um, I'd like to thank all the panelists. I found that really interesting to hear from Jocelyn, Sadipto Manal, and also Katie about the different perspectives. I was just reflecting on some of the things that you were saying and the way that UNDP goes forward. I think it's, it's very important that we have to recognize how hard these processes are. Um, and I mean, Jocelyn put it very well by saying, by being very humble about what we can actually do within them. Um, and we shouldn't downplay the challenges. So Dipto very well illustrated that 
when talking about the need for elections to actually incentivize service delivery. It's very hard to actually address these issues if you don't have the right incentive framework in place. And we constantly in UNDP, as Katie talked about, are looking at the political economy and how we can actually understand what's going on in order to, to put forward and co-create different solutions with the communities that we're working with. Um, and it's a long-term process. Everyone said that. I had underlined it several times from all of our participants, and we know that at UNDP. But we don't always have the luxury of being able to start a process with a long-term vision. We, have to, we work within a community where we, as has been mentioned, we have cyclical challenges. But to move from uh, things that are tricky, I'd like to move a little bit onto some of the things that our panelists mentioned that we have learned as UNDP, and we do try and, and look at in different contexts. Obviously, we make sure that everything is context specific and that we're looking at the details and understanding the communities that we're in. And Sedipto, I think, well illustrated that when talking about the Chittagong Hill tracks is that it's not managed from Dhaka. It's managed from the area and, it, and it's local people that are working on these challenges. It's the same in eastern Ukraine and also across all the regions of Somalia. Um, so that some of the things we've we've learned or are trying to learn, I think Jocelyn put it very well, is that ensuring that we're leaving no one behind, we have to look at the different groups that have less power. You mentioned clans that are not as so prominent. You mentioned women within traditional religious uh, justice systems. We've learned that we have to really emphasize um, the, the needs and the understanding and listening of these people and that when we're creating platform approaches that we bring in all of these particular views within it. And it is important that we're actually talking about platform approaches. All of you emphasize that. Um, and Sedipto very clearly said, we're talking about an area-based multi-sectoral approach. We cannot address these issues from just one strand. We cannot just look at, at one idea or, or one area of work. This is the not a way community, this is not the way individuals work, it's not the way groups work, it's not the way communities work. Um, and the, 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 another important factor that we've learned is that it, it is, this is something that we are privileged to be able to work with the communities that we work with. It is, it is within the communities and there's a national ownership that is very fundamental and important to all our work, as Sedipto said the schools that we help support are now government run. That is something that will always be a core principle within the work that we're moving forward and something that we've learned taking, um, addressing these active and protracted conflicts. Uh, we're stronger when we, we work together. And Manal mentioned this in saying that the long-term project in Eastern Ukraine is looking at a systems-based approach, but working with others. We need to work with different groups and we need to come together and. And with all the complexities that that brings, working on a complex issue, but working with different groups. We need to look at new ways of delivery. We're constantly trying to come up with different ideas or having different discussions, talking to different people. And in some cases they work, such as the administrative service and delivery in Ukraine. And in some instances, we have to continue tweaking until we're able to actually get to a point where we're, we're seeing something that is delivering what's needed for the people. Um, I really, I think Justin put it really well when he said that um, we're talking about populations that are under a lot of stress, continual stress. And we have to take that into consideration even when we're talking about institution building. It's easy to talk about the technical side of an institution without recognizing that institutions are made of people. And UNDP is trying very hard to make sure that within this people-centered approach that we take that idea and that we're able to have that at the core of the work that we, we take moving forward. Thank you very much, Sanula. Uh, thank you, Jill. And uh, yes, a very wordy title, but at least um, you, you know exactly what your responsibilities are, I suppose. Um, a question for the panel, and it's kind of related to something you touched on there, Jill, about delivery. Um, it's a broader question about how do you identify the needs of people and align with government services so to be able to order to meet those needs. And I ask that, uh, I might start with Manal first if that's okay, because I ask that in relation to the challenges posed by COVID in doing that, Manal. Sure, uh, this is the million dollars question and I think this has been addressed by uh, the institutional, I would say, capacity development that we have in place. So, and both for individuals and for, so the duty bearers and the service providers and eventually the people we serve. What had worked in Ukraine is that through these community security and social cohesion working groups, 
the, the needs and priorities and the most urgent uh, asks of people are actually voiced through these channels. And again, they go, um, they are channeled back to the to the local government who are also represented in these working groups. So, so the identification of needs is done in a, in a more comprehensive and participatory manner. And it's no longer just optional to consult. It's mandatory now for the development of the local budget plan uh, to be participatory. So, so we've piloted this work on uh, participatory budget planning, where people have their own voices and contribution to the needs and priorities that they want to see being implemented in the region, uh, from street lighting to probably a person with disability, center of rehabilitation. So the process is quite lengthy, but it's worthwhile. And it's important that we, we develop the capacities, not only of the institutions as um, Katie and Amy had mentioned, but also of the people who are um, who are voicing their asks, so that they know how to verb uh, formulate it and how to articulate what they need and what should be done. What matters is that I think one of the issues that we have uh, taken into account in times of COVID is the digital literacy, and this is something that we really need to be careful of because while uh, being proud of what what has uh, succeeded, it's important also to look of what could have failed if we do not engage with people uh, uh, who are left behind and who are not able to connect with us through those digital solutions that we put in place, the video calls or the video consultative processes. So looking into the capacities, giving a voice to the ones that are supposed to be um, articulating their needs, engaging with the civil society at the same time with local authorities, sustaining um, the institutional capacity development and the institutional solution, and including it as, as part of what the local governance actors are doing is something quite critical and crucial in this process, I would say. And thank you, Manal. And Amy, and I apologise, uh, Amy, if, if you um, have been listening to that, and, and do you, how does that align what you've been thinking with about delivery? Thanks, Manila. Um, I mean, uh, I think Manal and I speak very similarly on this topic in terms of, of service delivery and ensuring that people's voices are actually heard. It's a very difficult process to actually do because I think with the majority of us, we do not necessarily interact with our local governments. Everyone on this call has probably very rarely actually spoken to their local authority unless they have a problem. So we as UNDP have recognized that we need to set up as well as participatory mechanisms, which are very important because there are always those people that are active when they have a particular concern, but also when they have a particular complaint or issue, we need to make sure that we have a grievance management mechanism as well to allow those complaints to come back to the, the local government in order to ensure that service delivery is dictated by those, those particular interests too. And, and, and I wonder, Jocelyn, if I could come to you on the back of that, you know, you mentioned accountability when in your remarks earlier. I mean, in terms of grievances and accountability, are they the same thing in your mind? Are you talking about a, a much broader accountability in, in Somalia? Well, yeah, let me take that. Uh, yes, uh, let me take that from a slightly different um, uh, from an inter from a slightly different angle. I mean, I think uh, colleagues have spoken a lot about um, people being able to voice their needs and concerns, particularly in the time of COVID and finding new mechanisms for people to be able to, for us to hear what or us and local government to hear um, what uh, people want to say and need to say. I think the other side of it is, is if for us, and this speaks to accountability as well, is that it, in a country such as Somalia, it is extraordinarily difficult to access people. Um, our ability to, and we need to think about all sorts of new ways of doing it, our ability to go out and talk to communities is tremendously compromised because the security that we face is is just doesn't allow for it. Not to mention that the simple road infrastructure, air infrastructure, and all this sort of thing becomes, makes it, uh, makes a, and a very large country in this case as well, makes it very difficult for us to reach people. Um, we do so, I mean, I was in uh, Dusamareb, which is in the, the capital of, of um, Gamaduk state only yesterday, um, and we uh, reach out, but it, it's uh, are, they are um, very costly processes. We have to work through government and we have to find ways in which government and other um, actors on our behalf can engage with communities as well. 
Um, so we, it, it, is a constant, um, it is a constant effort, but it's one that we need to be able to do better at. And of course, throughout my 20 year career or in, with UNDP and many more than that, even before, um, it's been one of our constant challenges is to be able to push our ability to reach uh, people at community level in order to be able to improve uh, the way services are delivered. Um, thank you very much, um, because it raises another question there, I suppose that's something Katie touched on earlier um, about you know, security. I think the phrase that you used was we need to think, um, rethink security and think about security development. Katie, would you be happy to just expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, of course. Um, so thanks for the question. I was thinking about accountability, so I was starting to answer from that. You're, you're, <laughs> no, welcome, no you're welcome to it's you very know, segue from that into accountability. If the, like. the two are very linked, obviously, because of all sectors that we work with, the, uh, the police service, it's most important that the police services and the security engagement has mechanisms for disciplinary um, action, for complaints and for grievances to be communicated by communities to enable, uh, because in the end, at the end of the day, they have, uh, they are able to legally use force, they're able to, able to engage in public order, work and repression. And often in the many of the societies we work in, they are unfortunately ill-equipped or ill-trained or insufficiently capacitated to do what's inc incredibly complex work. Um, so one of the pieces of uh, work we do, which aligns with what you've been hearing around uh, about around local governance is, around, is what we call community security, people-centered security, which is very much about working um, at local level, including establishing community policing systems, and working to have dialogue systems um, which go, uh, which run the gamut from being community based uh, dialogue meetings that are held with the police and the municipalities, or to have desks that sit in town halls that are more accessible, that maybe not in a police station, but are sitting um, in a town hall, all through, all through digitized approaches. Now that we, now that apps um, and uh, apps are more widely used across many of the countries, it's possible for complaints to be filed or needs to be um, highlighted through digital means. Through all these different types of participation and engagement with um, ordinary people, they're able not only to access the advice, but also to obtain support on solutions. And the solutions can be being accompanied by lawyers and advisors or legal aid providers, and also um, UNDP's governance accompaniment, monitoring the capacity and capability of the services we're working with to see where we need to work with our partners to improve those capacities. So we can, at the one hand, be working with ordinary people to um, support them in their complaint of police service to try and make sure they get redressed and to make sure that their complaint is heard. And at the same time, be working with the services to improve the quality of what they do. So, and, and it's pretty, very important for most of the context that we work in. On a system-wide basis, we work on concepts such as community policing and looking at, for example, embed very positive human resources practices within institutions. As Amy said, institutions are people. And if, what, if those people are police officers, they have a particularly powerful role in people's lives, as we've been hearing um, you know, loud and clear for the last one or two years in the Black Lives Matter movement in, in the USA in particular. So police officers as, as individuals need those capacities and need that form of support, but it needs to be embedded institutionally. Why do we see connect security with development? I think I probably made that fairly clear in the sense that what we're, what we're doing in our engagement in the security sector is to make sure that it's right size and fit for purpose. It's not overfunded vis-a-vis -vis other areas of development. That we're, not, we're not working with governments who really underwrite security, underwrite security at the expense of other very important developmental investments like health, education, and local services. Um, so it's right size and then fit for purpose in the sense that it, uh, uh, they're able to um, uh, respect human rights, able to engage in dialogue with communities, in particular with women, and to make sure they're providing calibrated services that meet the needs of the whole population. 
another important component, and then I'll stop because I could talk forever, obviously, on these topics. Yeah, we have a few questions. Yeah. It's really about having women represented within all of these services, in particular in the judiciary and the police, to make sure that women's interests are heard and represented um, in the work that they do. I'll stop there. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you very much, of course, uh, Katie. A uh, question uh, from one of um, the attendees, uh, Lindsay Peterson, um, who has a question which is related to community security and social cohesion and access. And really what Lindsay would like to know is about what the best approaches are. What are some of the more soft approaches that any of you have seen work and perhaps create more opportunities for increased engagement? Would uh, anybody like to take that uh, question? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I could try answering that, but before that, you know, I just wanted to mention something else is the importance of data. And, you know, uh -huh. we often don't invest enough in data. Uh, just to give you an example, just to just next to the Chittagong Hill Tracks is Cox's Bazaar, which is, you know, is home to a million Rohingya population from next door. And, and one of the things that UNDP has been doing, leading a multi-agency exercise is actually trying to look at the whole how do you operationalize the, the triple nexus, humanity and development, peace nexus there. And when you start looking at, you see some, one of the first things that you notice that there's not enough data. There's not enough local data available. And, the, and then you start collecting data and data is collected not just by uh, you know, speaking to people, speaking to uh, the expert agencies, et cetera, but actually spatially mapping the data. Then you suddenly build up a, a, a evidence base which shows that you know, it is not spatially and equitably distributed. You will have, and if you look at the district level, maybe it looks fine in, in terms of averages, but when you look at it, how this distribution is, some places are overserved and some places are underserved. And when you get closer and you start looking at services, you might see that there is an infrastructure, but there is not enough services. For example, there is a school building, but the school cannot be accessed for six months of the year because the access road doesn't work. So I think, you know, and, and, and this is something that we need to focus more and more in terms of making sure that is it infrastructure or is it the underlying services that we need to ensure? And I want to, you know, focus on something that Katie had mentioned earlier on, on uh, some sort of outcome-based monitoring is something that we, we need to do a much more about. But on the whole issue of uh, community cohesion, I think, you know, one of the things that I think, you know, uh, is perhaps a long-term investment uh, that we need to do and we are unfortunately not always able to do is because of our cyclical approaches, because our projects are typically three years, five years, uh, limited funding and, and, and not being able to do that. But I think it's important that we use every possible uh, uh, you know, project on the ground to be able to actually maintain an, a, a dialogue with people a constant dialogue with people and I say use the word dialogue here because I think you know there is also a tendency to speak to people rather than speak with people so it's, it's, it's it might sound a very subtle difference but you know even when you're looking at COVID uh, and I've seen this you know work in in, in terms of you know uh, raising awareness about COVID uh, instead of just using a mic and you know uh, or putting up posters here and there when you actually go and speak to people about the problem then it the you are better heard. And I think that is something that we need to invest much, much more in. And understanding the difference in approaches can make when you are speaking to and speaking with. Speaking with. Um, thank you very much for that. I know there was a question on, on data information every time we'll go back to it. Um, but I'd like now to go to someone who's been uh, battling with a, a, an internet connection that hasn't been necessarily um, complying. Samuel Risk is in Armenia, he's head of conflict prevention, peace building and responsive institutions at UNDP. And thank you very much indeed, Sam, for being so patient and we're delighted we're able to bring you into this discussion. And, and perhaps maybe you have some words uh, or comments on, on this last question about social cohesion. Uh, thanks very much, Fanula. Thanks, colleagues, and sincere apologies for connectivity issues. I'll just mention a few quick things. I'll start with the social cohesion part. I think. Um, I think uh, the discussion around social cohesion necessarily relates to three things, three SCs, as, as it turns out. And we heard from all of the speakers about that social contract, social cohesion, and social capital. Um, in a lot of what we heard, I think today it's the relationship uh, between. 
between people, security, and job conflict settings. But I think a lot of the discussion around social cohesion is actually it's a community to community, interpersonal, people to people engagement. And I think. Yeah. We and UNDP are really good at. Uh, uh, I think I think if you don't mind, if Samuel can hear us, Samuel, your your connection isn't great and it's stalling. So we might try to work on this in the last few minutes because it would be really good to hear your voice. Faces, comments. Go ahead. As Samuel, let's just uh, park it there for a moment, if you don't mind, and maybe we can try and connect with you again. And if you can, if we can, I'll certainly go back to you before we close. I, I would just like to go to Manal on a question that she raised about, she wanted to talk about policing. Um, you mentioned that in your opening remarks, Manal, and I wonder if, and, and the involvement of women, I think the inclusion of women in policing. It is actually all women. So uh, what we have done in, in Ukraine is that we ensured that women are part and parcel and essential uh, group to be to be serving in this, uh, in this uh, sector of the work that we do. And uh, we have a quite successful program, of course, after different attempts of engaging and ensuring that we listen and we learn what are the community needs and, and who the community would trust the most in terms of um, having the security issues being discussed um, uh, at large. So yes, the program targets uh, women in, in that perspective. And uh, the, they have proven to be actually quite successful. This, this exercise that was done in the east of the country uh, with the women police uh, had now been replicated elsewhere in the country and the ministry is quite important, interested in this exercise. So I think one element that I would like to bring here is not only uh, focusing on the, what normally uh, are called the vulnerable groups or the most um, the ones that are not necessarily always included, it is important that once we do so, we highlight and we leverage this type of results that we that we work on. And, and the work with the women police uh, had actually been leveraged to the national level and has been portrayed in different regional fora uh, where Ukraine police uh, women had uh, had shared their experience and, and uh, work in that area. Um, one element I would like to mention just in an answer to the community security and social cohesion, and I think what Sam was trying to mention about the people-to-people -people contact and having myself worked in, in Syria, it is important to um, to establish the networks at the local level with the community uh, with the community uh, representatives. So this is still possible. The soft skills or the soft interventions that we do to improve soft skills, to improve communication, to improve dialogue. It's not only a dialogue platform. It actually is a democracy tool, and it allows people to once again voice their concerns. I liked what Sudipto mentioned to talk. Uh, with people rather than talking to people. I would I would even challenge that and I say, let's listen to them first before we talk to them and ensure that we understand what are their needs and priorities and let them develop solutions and with our support, with our comparative advantage, bring some leverage to it. Okay, Manal, thank you. Um, uh, I'd just like to um, read out some of the comments that we've been getting from our uh, people who've been, who've been watching this over the last 90 minutes or so, because we are beginning to wind down and run out of time. Caitlin Boyce says community engagement is key. However, we know communities are homogenous. Katie rightly mentioned the importance of ensuring women's voices are heard in ROI and peace building in all diversity. Um, she would like the panel to elaborate on best practices for eliciting their engagement, especially in contexts where women's, the women's movement is, is perhaps curtailed or safety is compromised. Um, another uh, number of questions were from uh, Abdinasir Sharif, what does the community think of ROI? What do we know? How do they define it, ROI, and their perspectives? How we confirm the assumptions we're making regarding this? Have we ever tested out our assumptions? How can we know the starting point of the community? What methodologies do ROI use to inform if we're making the right or wrong assumptions? Lots and lots of questions there, but what I would like to do is go to the panel and see if anybody would like to take that on. Maybe I can talk if you want, um, um, Fernola, on the 
on the perception and the understanding of the rule of law, I think it's important for us to, to learn and to understand what have uh, gone wrong. I think sometimes we embark on these activities and these programs um, assuming that everybody understands what rule of law is and what community security is. And when we approach uh, communities asking for their opinions, once again, talking to them rather than with them, uh, they might just come up with different uh, a list of, of requests rather than a comprehensive, uh, I would say, solution for, for the problems. Um, so I agree with a colleague who has asked the question, uh, working on improving the understanding and the perception of what rule of law is and how it could be better understood by local communities, but also by uh, local authorities or national authorities that are supposed to deliver this. How could they articulate and communicate to their uh, constituents about, about these issues is something critical. In terms of insurance, go ahead, sorry. No, I think, you know, we talk about rule of law as, as it's a bit like the speaking with and speaking to, like, oh, well, to the people, for the people, by the people. I, I, and just a wider question, how inclusive can that be in a situation, particularly for women, where they might be find themselves in situations, Jocelyn, in Somalia, where they're not able to speak out, for example, or they might be in trouble for speaking out? I mean, again, I think one has to address this question with a great deal of uh, sensitivity and, and humility. Um, I think, and when I say the humility part, I think we also need to acknowledge that societies are not as straightforward as one might think. Um, you know, in this, it, it, there are spheres in which women have uh, a considerable amount of strength and authority within societies. They're, they're separate spheres as the, uh, uh, in many cases, and it's not necessarily the sphere where power exists. But, enable, but engaging in, in a community dialogue, which brings in the issues of the, the feminine sphere, so to speak, um, can help begin to engage a, a population that has been held silent um, around, for example, um, uh, you know, um, a family's nutrition. Uh, uh, but then you begin to start engaging that, that community in, in a different type of dialogue as well. Um, it's something that has to uh, grow uh, um, naturally within the community itself um, and needs to be part of an ongoing dialogue. Um, I, I think you'll often find that communities express the fact, and then many men are expressing the fact, that women are key to peace, but don't necessarily include women in the dialogues around peace, but that in itself gives one an opening for further engagement. So again, it's, uh, there's nothing simple about this. Uh, this is extraordinarily complex and it has, we, one has to address it with a considerable degree of, of um, again, we've talked about listening and, uh, and uh, understanding. I mean, going to uh, Sharif's point, uh, do we know how communities define rule of law? Well, we're not really asking in some ways, I mean, let me turn the question around and say, we're not really asking what, what communities think about rule of law, but are rather, what is it communities need? Um, they're often asking for their ability to look after themselves and their families peacefully. Uh, are we, um, uh, is there a way of resolving uh, the disputes that have emerged in their, their community? And is there, a, and what ways do we have of uh, seeking some form of reparations or some form of reconciliation around some of the injustices that have been uh, done in the past. That's really what people want. And that the, they don't necessarily define that as rule of law, but they define that as this is what makes, this is what the glue of our society is. And that's what in some ways rule of law ends up being. It's how do we resolve the differences in our society so we can move, move forward in a way that is peaceful. Over. And, the, and this and this also sort of is against the backstrop of something that you refer to in your opening um, remarks about Western approaches in, in certain countries and how they work. I'm, I'm going to try one more time just before we go to, to go to Samuel Risk, who we were speaking to earlier. Bad connection in a car in Armenia. He's been really patient. Uh, if, if he's there, wonderful. And if he's not, uh, we will just go back to Amy for a closing remark. Thanks very much, uh, Fanula. Apologies again. Is this working? 
just a note. I think it we'll, is. We'll it's okay. great to see you. Okay, here. good, good. Um, again, thanks, and thanks to Manel for completing part of my answer uh, as well. Um, I just wanted to take to that one step further. I think in fragile and conflict settings, uh, a number of colleagues spoke about this. Some of the some of the interpersonal dialogue spaces uh, we must realize are happening across border, uh, cross border, uh, among communities that uh, find themselves in situations they haven't been for quite a long time. So that division, I think, requires us to think quite a bit more creatively about how we bring people together. What are those spaces, intercommunal spaces, and who are the people that do this? And I think we heard today about you know, uh, training 100 trust builders. I think that's really quite important uh, uh, in the sense of how we talk about supporting local capacity for prevention and peace. I'll just wrap up with maybe five or six quick thoughts that I think I heard uh, today, either from the responses to the questions or the initial um, or the initial points. One is uh, over the past uh, couple of years, really, we've been talking about this, um, uh, what a development entity does in these particularly difficult contexts. And we've come up with this broad slogan called development pathways to prevention and peace building. I think what we are starting to see is that in many contexts, and the colleagues all spoke about this, uh, it actually ends up being slightly more reversed. It's a prevention and peace building pathway back to development through resilience, through recovery, uh, et cetera. A lot of the engagements on social cohesion, on peace, on institutions, I think really reflect that sense. There's another thing that has also been flipped, this humanitarian development peace nexus. A lot of the peace colleagues that we sp speak to are now speaking about the, the PDH, the peace development and humanitarian nexus, uh, given that at the earliest, we actually want to support our partners, our counterparts, particularly in local areas, uh, to really think about how to exit you know, humanitarian context as soon as possible to avoid dependency, how to encourage more of the development solution to crisis, uh, to prevention and, um, and to peace. A lot of what we also heard is the institutions-based part. There's another popular slogan that we use, institutions-based and people-centered. And I think all of that comes into the mix of what we heard from um, uh, Ukraine, and uh, uh, Somalia and Bangladesh. These institutions and the results that we know are the best are often happening at the local district municipal level. Uh, a lot of these institutions are first responders. They are uh, the ones that are able to support impact. We learn quite a lot from them and inclusion and uh, helping people really matters uh, so much there. On innovation, I think, um, uh, and integration, I think, what we've heard today is uh, quite a bit uh, about avoiding the integration paralysis or the innovation paralysis by trying to do things uh, so quickly or trying to put a lot of things together at the same time. But we effectively hear about institutions-based, people-centered, and we hear about jobs, services, infrastructure, social cohesion, governance, and institutions that promote human security. So there's no real integration paralysis in what we heard, but we heard a responsiveness to, to the needs of, uh, of the people um, uh, as well. Um, uh, maybe that's a good place to close and really appreciating um, uh, your patience and all of the colleagues engagement uh, as panelists, all of the participants for joining us uh, today, well over 100 excellent questions, please reach out to us to be able to, um, to to um, respond to some of these questions, perhaps bilaterally, and I think like Katie said uh, as well, you know, watch the space for the next um, four or five years worth of programming in UNDP, where we really hope to be able to do more um, uh, to work on prevention and peace and support institutions, particularly, but not only in fragile um, and conflict affected settings. The examples that we heard today are wonderful, um, and there's much more of that happening around uh, the world as well with us, with our partners in the UN system and outside. Thanks again, Mula, back, back to you. Sam, it's just been wonderful to be able to close with you finally. And again, uh, we really appreciate you there. I think it's probably a timely reminder that as much as we're used to being able to operate on Zooms and have a wonderful connectivity despite COVID, that, uh, that we are um, at the mercy of, of the, the gremlins um, when it comes to uh, connections. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Apologize if we didn't get to all your questions. I think time, as usual, ran away with us. Thanks also particularly to our speakers and panelists. Wonderful to hear from you both. And I hope you all, and I hope that you have really enjoyed this latest in the Development Dialogue session, putting people at the center of rule of law and peace building.
Thank you for watching. Thanks so much, Benula. Well, thank, thank you. you. We thank you. <laughs>